About four, three weeks ago, I got an email from one of our board members. And the board member inquired, uh, and because a family was going to come to Bioneers, and he inquired this. We are concerned that David Corton's message will be too negative to load onto their 14-year-old son. <laughs> the person inquiring asked me if you could say anything about the burden of your theme and if it will depress the heck out of young teenagers who are highly concerned about the planet but overwhelmed at the task before them. I sent that directly to David. <laughs> David replied, the depth of the problem cannot be denied. And I mince no words about that. But we are not going to solve the problem by pretending it doesn't exist. Most people find my message regarding the possibilities to be hopeful, highly hopeful. I find I'm most often criticized by cynics who say I'm unreasonably optimistic about the possibility of finding solutions. It's too late. We're cooked. They may be right, but they create a self-fulfilling problem prophecy, so I don't have much time for them. Sounds to me like the Sun may have a pretty good handle on the reality and is apparently committed to working for solutions. I hope he will come and I will have an opportunity to meet him. We need the youth energy. Hopefully my message might help him find his path of contribution. David Corton, first of all, is an advisor at the Whitby Institute. He's a longtime friend. He has uh, always been a person we can turn to for, for many questions. He's also the president and founder of the People Centered Development Forum, chair of the board of Yes Magazine, and I guess he has to work with a publisher. His wife, Fran, is publisher of Yes Magazine. Um, he's a founding board member of the Business Alliance for Local and Living Economy. He's advisory board of the Windy Institute. <laughs> David has been on both sides of the economic issues we face. He has worked in the public private sector for much of his early life. His transformation to the David Court that we all know and respect today was quietly pushed from his friends in Asia, who firmly told him that if he wanted to change the world and the world view, he needed to do this from the US, not another country. David listened. His books include The Great Turning, From Corporations Rule the World, Post-Corporate World, and The Agenda for the New Economy. He is a friend and mentor to many of us in the Puget Sound, and mentions that once he, once he turned 65, he became clear. I wondered what it was about, but he said it was a, maybe it was a growing sense of wisdom, perhaps grandchildren, or that he does not need to beat people around anymore, about the possibilities that The Great Turning offered. It is with great um, respect, honor, and privilege that I introduce to you David Corton, our keynote speaker for my <laughs> Well, that makes the introduction pretty hard to live up to. Yeah, when Jerry uh, invited me to come speak at this event, I was just totally thrilled. Um, first of all, because, of course, I have so many wonderful friends in the room, but also, you know, I keep hearing about the amazing things that you folks are doing here on Whidbey Island. Um, you know, this kind of experimentation, this bubbling up from below, what I refer to as creating the new reality from the bottom up, is happening all over the world, which is part of what gives us the sense of hope and possibility. But from what I hear, you folks here on Whitby are really pushing the envelope on that, way beyond what anybody else has. And you've got this enormous complex of resources. So it is extremely exciting. And uh, I'm hoping those of you who come to the uh, workshop session tomorrow, uh, we can maybe talk about how all these things come together within what you're, uh, what you're doing here. I'm also particularly delighted to be speaking here in Thomas Berry Hall. Thomas challenged us to rethink our defining stories of the cosmos. And his challenge had a particularly important impact in my life that I will talk about in a minute. So between what you're doing 
uh, in terms of creating the new reality and the work on the new story. These are what I refer to, I'll come back to this at the end of the lecture, but three critical interventions for the deep change we need to navigate. One is change the framing stories of the culture, and that's, that, that's what is particularly key with the Institute and what you're doing here. Um, the second is create the new reality from the bottom up, which is what most all of you are working on here. And the third is change the rules. That's, that's a little bit different issue. We'll come back to that. Now, Thomas Berry and the Whitby Institute have both had a powerful influence on my life and work, particularly in my understanding of cultural stories. Back in 1994, when I was writing the epilogue to the first edition of A Corporation's Rule the Book, Rule the World. <laughs> we can stop and reflect on that a little bit. <laughs> Anyhow, when, when, I, when I was writing when Corporations Rule the World, I was puzzling over a common reaction. Uh, when I spoke to audiences, I also often got the reaction of well, you know, you're probably right that, you know, we're, we humans are headed off of a cliff, we're, we're cooked, we're finished, but, you know, it would be so difficult and so expensive to change. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, that's really a little weird. <laughs> um, it was like people were saying, you know, there's, there's no real profit in human survival. <laughs> But anyhow, we'll know when the party's over when the last light goes out. <laughs> hey, let's, let's boogie. <laughs> boogie. <laughs> <laughs> anyhow, the basic outlines of what we must do to avoid self-destruction of the species have actually long been pretty clear to, to a lot of us, and I assume to most in this room. And yet I came to sense that if survival holds no larger meaning for us, avoiding extinction is not a sufficient reason to draw us to the difficult changes we need to make. To make a choice for life, we must be drawn by a compelling vision of new possibilities grounded in a deep sense of meaning. And that is where our creation stories come in. So as I was struggling to sort this out, uh, and, and if you look, if any of you look at the epilogue to the first edition of From Corporation to Rule World, you see me playing this out. As I was struggling with it, I came across Thomas Berry's Dream of the Earth. And his defining statement jumped out at me. <laughs> For peoples generally, their story of the universe and the human role in the universe is their primary source of intelligibility and value. The deepest crises experienced by any society are those moments of change when the story becomes inadequate for meeting the survival demands of a present situation. There is the moment. I realize this is the key. To make the changes essential to our survival, we humans must have a story that makes our survival meaningful. Now the truth is, much to my frustration, dream of the earth only hints at the need of the story. Of course, Thomas and Brian Swim went, went further later on, but I was looking, that was after my struggle. <laughs> 